You were calling from San Francisco. He said, I did. I said, but I was lying. Click. It was definitely time to leave. The last loose end in the Salazar case had been knotted up that morning when the jury came back with the guilty verdict for Corky Gonzalez. He was sentenced to 40 days and 40 nights in the L.A. County Jail for possession of a loaded revolver on the day of Salazar's death. We'll appeal, said Acosta. But for political purposes, this case is finished. Nobody worried about Corky surviving 40 days in jail. We wanted to comfort, confront the Gabacho court system with the man the whole Chicano community knew was technically innocent. Then let them draw their own conclusions about the verdict. Hell, we never denied that somebody had a loaded pistol in the truck, but it wasn't Corky. He, would, he wouldn't dare carry a goddamn gun around with him. He's a leader. He doesn't have to carry a gun for the same goddamn reason Nixon doesn't. Acosta had not stressed that point in the courtroom for fear of alarming the jury and inflaming the gringo press, not to mention the cops. Why give them the same kind of flimsy excuse to shoot at Gonzalez that they already used to justify shooting Ruben Salazar? Corky merely shrugged, shrugged at the verdict. At 42, he had spent half his life gouging justice out the man, and now he views the Anglo court system with the quiet sort of fatalistic humor that Acosta hasn't learned yet. But Oscar is getting there fast. The week of April Fool's Day, 1971, was a colossal bummer for him, a series of bad jolts and setbacks that seemed to confirm all his worst suspicions. Two days after Corky's conviction, Superior Court Judge Arthur Alarcón, a prominent Mexican-American jurist, rejected Acosta's carefully constructed motion to quash the Biltmore Six indictments because of subconscious institutional racism in the grand jury system. This effort had taken almost a year of hard work, much of it done by Chicano law students who reacted to the verdict with a bitterness matching Acosta's. Then later the same week, the Los Angeles Board of Supervisors voted to use public funds to pay all legal expenses for several policemen recently indicted for accidentally killing two Mexican nationals, a case known in East L.A. as the murder of the Sanchez, the San, the Sanchez brothers. And it was a case of mistaken identity. The cops explained they had somehow been given the wrong address of an apartment where they thought two Mexican fugitives were holed up. So they hammered on the door and shouted a warning to come out there with your hands over your head or we'll come in shooting. Nobody came out, so the cops went in shooting to kill. But how could they have, how could they have known that? They'd attack the wrong apartment. And how could they have known that neither one of the Sanchez brothers understood English? Even Mayor Sam Yordi and Police Chief Ed Davis admitted that the killings had been very unfortunately. But when the federal DA brought charges against the cops, both Yordi and Davis were publicly outraged. They both called press conferences and went on the air to denounce the indictments in language that strangely echoed the American Legion outcry when Lieutenant Callie was charged with murdering women and children at my lay, lie, at my LAI. The Yordi Davis tirades were so gross that a district court judge finally issued a gag order to keep them quiet until the cases comes to trial, but they had already said enough to whip the whole body onto a rage at the idea that Chicano's tax dollars might be used to defend some mad dog cops who frankly admitted killing two Mexican nationals. It sounded like a replay of the Salazar bullshit. Same style, same excuse, same result, but this time with different names and blood on a different floor. They'll put me in jail if I won't pay taxes said young Chicano watching soccer game at the loyal local playground. Then they take my tax money and use it to, to defend some killer pig. 
Hell, what if they had come to my address by mistake? I'd be dead as hell right now. There was a lot of talk in the body about drawing some pig blood for a change. The supervisors actually voted to use tax funds to defend the accused cops. A few people actually called City Hall and mumbled anonymous threats in the name of the Chicano Liberation Front. But the supervisors hung tough. They voted on Thursday and by noon the news was out. The city would pick up the tab. At 5.15 p.m. on Thursday afternoon, the Los Angeles City Hall was rocked by a dynamic blast. A bomb had been planted in one of the downstairs restrooms. Nobody was hurt, and the damage was officially described as minor. About $5,000 worth, they said. Small potatoes compared to the bomb that blew a wall out of the district attorney's office last fall after Salazar died. When I called the sheriff's office to ask about the explosion, they said they couldn't talk about it. City Hall was out of their jurisdiction, but they were more than willing to talk when I asked if it was true that the bomb had been the work of the Chicano Liberation Front. Where'd you hear that? From the city news service? Yeah, it's true, he said. Some women called up and said it was done in memory of the Sanchez brothers by the Chicano Liberation Front. We've heard about those guys. What do you know about them? Nothing, I said. That's why I called the sheriff. I thought your intelligence network might know something. Sure they do, he said quickly. But all that information is confidential. This is printed by the Rolling Stone, number 81, April the 19th, or I'm sorry, April the 29th of 1971. Almost a year exactly after the death of Ruben Salazar.